very much for making a long stay. Uh, if you're interested and want to know more about CSIP, please like us on Facebook, leave your email address to get on our mailing list, and do keep in mind that we've got elections coming up in the next few weeks. Um, today I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Martin Jardin, um, author of Poor Numbers from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, and he's here to talk about his new book, Africa, Why Economists Get It Wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, Society for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to come here to speak to an almost full room. So that's uh, great. And I see there is a lot of students, perhaps many undergraduate students. So I can have now the chance to shape some of your minds so you do not get misled as previous generations of economists. So uh, maybe there is hope yet. Uh, so I want to talk to you about Africa and why economists get it wrong. It's based on, my talk is based on uh, my most recent book with the same title. It has uh, uh, four chapters and uh, an introduction and a conclusion. And uh, my biggest motivation is uh, to try to explain how we could go from a growth tragedy to a growth miracle so quickly in the minds of economists. Because if you will, turn back to the front page of The Economist in the year 2000, then Sub-Saharan Africa was projected as the hopeless continent um, only 15 years ago. And it was a, on the editorial asked, uh, The Economist asked, does Africa have some inherent character flaw that keeps it backward and incapable of uh, development? And then it's in the kind of strange that only 11 years later, they managed to make a, a, a completely turn around and have the, exactly the opposite judgment, this time talking about the hopeful continent instead of the, the hopeless continent, and this time talking about Africa rising. So we went from a, a tragedy to a miracle. Um, and uh, s while we were looking for character flaws, we're now suddenly looking for, for roots of success. And in, indeed, this is uh, uh, um, <laughs> tempting to ask whether it is the editors of The Economist who have a character flaw that makes them incapable of consistent judgment. Well, that would be a bit unfair to The Economist. Uh, it's just a popular news magazine. Uh, what we really need to go to, to, to put the finger on this is mainstream economic analysis over the past two decades. Because when The Economist was putting up their front page and writing their editorial uh, in the year 2000, they were taking direct inspiration of mains from mainstream economic analysis at the time. So I would like to talk to you a little bit about how it came to pass that uh, uh, that uh, economists misunderstood economic growth in Africa, and uh, the answer lies in their methods and their ways that uh, uh, their models and methods shape their use of the evidence. So when it comes to uh, uh, diagnosing uh, economic growth, Paul Collier uh, might be familiar to many of you, um, also the author of, of Bottom Billion, in. Uh, later on, uh, probably the most famous book on uh, economic growth in Africa. In 1999, they, him together with Gunning, summarized a decade of economic research and said it's clear that Africa has suffered a chronic failure of economic growth and that the problem for analysis is to determine its causes. So they set up a research program, summarized what they've been doing. Africa has failed, it's hopeless, we just have to figure out why. Yeah? Uh, and even as late as in the uh, year 2007, Paul Collier publishes Bottom Billion, uh, where he says that uh, the central problem of the bottom billion is that they have not grown. Uh, the failure of the growth process in these societies simply has to be our car core concern. So that's what we've been delivered, an explanation to why Africa has failed. Uh, so we can now explain supposedly, referring to mainstream economic analysis, what's the character flaw? Yeah? What was it that keeps uh, Africa uh, incapable of economic development? Uh, 
The only problem is that this explanation does not match up with what we think we know happened. So African economies have been growing on average for two decades. So even when Paul Collier was writing the bottom billion, the majority of the countries he was writing about uh, saying that they were not growing, were growing. So what was going on here? They also, uh, these uh, most African economies on average grew in the 50s, the 60s, and the 1970s. So for some kind of reason, uh, no, the 1980s and 1990s gets to determine everything that we know about African economic grow growth according to mainstream economics. So my question in chapter one in the book is how could economists miss decades of economic growth and how could they solely fo focus on explaining lack of growth instead of explaining the growth that did occur. So in order to do that, we need to go to uh, Robert Barrow, professor of economics at, at Harvard, who wrote a seminal paper in 1991, where he provided also the workhorse for what would be uh, empirical growth research in the 1990s. He used the cross-country growth regressions. Uh, that means that on one side of the variable, what he wanted to explain, why, was average GDP growth rates in a global sample. And then he added different types of variables on the other side of the equation, such as a capital, labor, um, uh, political stability, assassinations, levels of year, average years of schooling, et cetera, et cetera, to try to explain variation in economic growth in the global sample. Uh, so they did that, explained for all, uh, but it still was what they called a, a residual. Um, a, a, a big part of the variation in economic growth was not explained by the normal factors. So then he put in a, uh, uh, a uh, what is called a uh, dummy variable, uh, this time a continent dummy variable. That means that the variable takes, a dummy variable is not a dumb variable, it's just the name of uh, something that is binary uh, in the variable sense, so that it can either take the value zero or one. So in this case, it's an African continent dummy variable. That means that if the country is on the African continent, it will get the value one. If it isn't, it gets the value zero, yeah? And then they run the regression again and found out that by just being identified as being an African country, it was then getting a, a negative sign, a significant negative sign in the regression and the statistical analysis of about 1%. So that meant, according to that paper, that there was something about being on the African continent that on average caused growth to be 1.1% slower. And the way that they interpreted this was that we have not come up with the variables that captures African uh, economies yet. And that's, that's still after in 1991. And, uh, and uh, after a decade of research later, the economists still summarized, as I said, African economies have grown inexplicably slowly. So that means they haven't solved the dummy variable. I'll move to a little. Uh, very soon I'll show you what kind of uh, variables they were suggesting and so forth like that. But let me first try, to, we have to s pause a little to, to remember that what they tried to explain was average GDP growth rates over the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And I'm going to show to you that they would, would have been asking very, very different questions if they were not looking at the average, okay? So that's the purpose of the next part of the talk. First here, this is not average, this is annual world GDP growth, yeah? So if you do all the countries in the world and you average their growth rate out, this is how it looks like. You know, at the highest uh, observations in the 60s and the 70s, around 4%, the lowest is around 2%. Then there are some big dips in the 1970s and some big peaks as well as there is a lot of price shocks and stuff like that in the 70s, and then uh, some, some plateauing out. So there's higher growth in the early period and then slower growth and then some improvement, yeah? However, uh, if you look at the African per capita GDP growth rate, it actually lo doesn't look all that different, yeah? You see as well, you know, that of course this is an African average and so forth like that, so it doesn't tell you very much, it's very much influenced by Nigeria and so forth, but it shows that there is growth in the early period, but there is perhaps 
following the same pattern, but perhaps a bit of a deeper, more negative trend in the, in the latter uh, half of the period. Yeah? So if you wanted to explain uh, this pattern, you will probably start thinking about something that was common to many of these countries in the 60s and the 70s, but that for some reason, destinies and luck and fortunes or policies or societies changed so what in the 80s and the 90s that meant that some parts of the world were doing much better than the rest yeah so you would start thinking about what is it that changed over time here and so forth like that but that's not what the economists set out to explain they wanted to know the differences in average gdp growth over the period yeah so that's this is what they wanted to explain the world grows at two percent on average whereas Sub-Saharan Africa grows at a half percent on average over the time. So what they're trying to find out is a variable that can capture the difference. So you want to find a negative variable. So something there is a so that that's what is summarizing the dummy variable is that there is a minus one point one something percent of growth that needs to be explained by something else that also African countries scores negatively or differently on. Yeah. So then uh, we got the question, why has Africa grown slowly? Which is actually a, a, a rephrasing on the question about that's, you know, why has uh, there been a chronic failure of growth? It's actually not a true thing. It's a stylized fact that comes only from uh, observing the average uh, pattern. So, and I argue that uh, that's what we got. And uh, so we s instead of asking how African economies grew, we had started to look at, at uh, factors that can explain the lack of growth between the world and Africa. So then you get, as you would expect, if you're trying to look for a, 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 a lack of growth, it's usually explained by a lack of something else. Yeah. So when Collier and uh, Gunny uh, summarized the literature to date in 1999 in their paper, and this is still uh, pr uh, uh, provides the foundation for the intellectual foundation for his book bottom billion in 2007, they explain that the lack of economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa explained by the lack of social capital in Africa. Lack of growth, deficiencies in, in a lack of growth is explained by the lack of openness to trade. Uh, deficiencies in performance is explained by deficiencies in public services. Low growth is explained by high risk in bad geography. Uh, lack of growth is explained by lack of financial debt. And again, uh, this time taking a positive, uh, matching a positive with a negative, a lot lack of growth means is explained by and correlated by uh, high aid dependence. But these are only uh, cross-sectional correlations. Yeah. So you need to take a leap of faith to believe these guys that this is somehow valid through time because their models do not test for uh, time in the same way as a historian would do. So if you start thinking about let's, let's disregard the average pa pattern and you actually look at the pa uh, pattern over time, then sub-Saharan African growth looks something like this, growing from about uh, $500 to $700 on average in the mid-70s. Then there is some peaks until 1981, and then there is back almost down to $550, and then it petters out to $600. This is in 1995 constant dollars. So that's, you would still, so then if you were looking at this particular pattern, you'd be looking for a, a, a variable that explains rapid growth in the 60s and into the 70s, shocks in the, 70, in the 70s into the 80s, decline uh, in GDP per capita terms in the 80s and the 90s, and then a stagnation and then an improvement in the 2000s. So let's review the list of lack of growth with the lack of other things with respect to this pattern. Well then, you have see that this average story runs into all kinds of problems. How about this kind of lack of social capital explanations or high ethnic fragmentation and stuff like that, these kind of character flaws, how do they match up? Well, not very well because you, you can't just say there is a correlation with the variable and slow growth on average. You still have to explain to me how that was okay for two de decades, and then in the 80s that turned to be a, a trigger of some sort. There is at least a lot of 
explaining left with the reader of these economic models. What about openness and being open versus closed, liberalizing versus having state controls? Well, that seems to be, uh, history tells, you know, if looking at correlation, tells exactly the opposite pattern. Uh, these economies are dominantly closed in the 60s and the 70s. Then in the 80s and 90s, they open up as part of IMF and the World Bank policies, and that's the period of economic decline. Yeah? I'm not saying that the IMF and the World Bank uh, did cause this decline, but it, at least it's a, a problematic kind of explanation to hold uh, if you look at the, the pattern. And it, you know, the IMF and the World Bank would turn around and say, look, now Africa is growing now. It's because the policies finally are working. Then you have to explain to me why it takes two decades before a policy actually starts about working. And so my argument is that they've uh, overemphasized the role of policy and underemphasized the role of luck and external conditions. And then there is all this kind of uh, governance matter, institutions matter type of literature, uh, which is trying to link, you know, African country, con countries scoring low on institutional quality on average or having high corruption on average, uh, being, uh, having high black market premiums for currencies on average, having high aid dependence on average, all of these things are post-shock phenomena. So this is, if you wanted to explain so bad social science where, with uh, some good example, you could reach for this, for instance, this high end aid dependence uh, types of argument. It's very, very clear that you're using the effect, uh, so uh, the, the effect of an economic crisis and letting things stand in as a cause. So clearly, these economies are receiving a lot of aid because growth failed, not the other way around. They did not grow slowly throughout the period because they got a lot of aid in the 1990s. If you looked about uh, all these measures of uh, institutional quality, those are subjective interviews conducted on the phone by the International Credit Risk Guide, uh, interviewing some foreign businessmen in Nigeria and Cameroon in 1984. They're not actually based on an investigation about how these institutions work or don't work in the 60s and the 70s because we, did, we, didn't, we didn't care in that much or we don't have a time to write the history and rather just go on. So you would think that these types of problems with the cause and effect, the problem of structural adjustment and liberalization policies actually not working as well as the theory books would have it, would cause, be some kind of cause for stopping, some cause for concern and revisiting that may be getting at knowledge through this kind of looking at correlations without any history, without country studies, maybe not the right way to good knowledge on this subject, but that's not what economists learn. They did accept the chronic failure of growth as a stylized fact, so it's still summarized as the, you know, the post-colonial economic growth failure, and not much is trying <coughs> to explain uh, uh, trajectories of economic growth. And you started stu rather to worry, just like I was worrying about, they were worrying about reversal causality, that for, of course, high aid might be caused by slow growth. Rather, that's probably how it is, not the other way around. So then, but then their thing to worry about that is that they want to then explain some, look for something that is not endogenous, but looks for something even more fundamental, a root cause, something that can explain both slow growth and high aid, yeah? So, uh, so to look for something uh, in history, books turns out to be great for such uh, explanations because we, wa we might think that Tanzania is receiving high aid because it's growing slowly, yeah? Or it might also be growing slowly because it's receiving a lot of aid, yeah? It's not the same type of argument you can make with that with saying we think that, that, uh, that uh, because Tanzania is growing slowly today, they are going to be colonized by Germany in the 19th century. So history is not subject to the same kind of of a reversal causality. You see what I'm saying? Yeah? Uh, so, so if you, if you can uh, look for a, a historical variable, you wouldn't be having those kind of uh, reversal causality problems. So then you start looking for uh, 
and this is where it starts, uh, the, this thing starts changing from get the prices right to get governance right. Uh, and we started saying institutions matter, history matters, and so forth like that. So in the book, I summarize this as the first generation of growth literature is asking, why has Africa grown slowly? Never mind asking, how did Africa grow? And then they answer, it's because they, they chose bad policies. And then they s decided after running uh, regressions on that for a decade and then some, found out that, oh well, these things are endogenous. What we need to know is why politicians are picking bad policies. So we're looking for, and here it is, the editorial in year 2000, the character flaw. Yeah? What made these countries go on, have a bad destiny, which makes them incapable of making the right type of policies. So we're looking for special African characteristics in the initial conditions. Yeah? What set them on the wrong path? And this is what I discuss in Trapped in History. And again, we need to look, be very, very careful that we note one thing, is that now we have changed again to on different types of stylized facts. So we were interested in explaining growth to begin with. Yeah? But then they stopped looking at growth, and they rather started looking at average growth. And then they agreed that the stylized fact is that there is a lack of growth in some part of the world, and there is growth in the, la the rest of the world. So now we need to explain the differences be 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 between the two. But then you can make a, another leap of faith, which is that lack, uh, low income today must be, the, uh, must be the effect of no growth yesterday. So now the growth literature is not even looking at growth. It's actually looking at explaining, finding a variable that correlates with variation in GDP per capita today. So not growth rates, but actually the, that the fact that Tanzania has $1,500 per capita and explain why Germany has 40 and Tanzania and try to explain the difference between the two rather than the difference between 2% to 4%. We're looking for something to explain why Tanzania is not Germany. Yeah? So that's what we're looking for. Not we, they. Yeah? <laughs> I'm not part of this. Um, so that's so then I think you are very gifted and clever students, so you can probably start thinking about some variables right now. You'll see that in this particular map, and this is only in this map, this not, does not extend to reality, being purple is a good thing. Yeah? So uh, the more purple you are, the darker purple, in fact, the richer you are in this particular map. Yeah? You see Norway up there, where I'm from, very, very dark purple, where it goes very faded indeed down around, particularly around the equator in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where it is uh, lighter shades in South Asia and some kind of a medium purple in, in, in uh, Latin America. Yeah, so we're trying to look for a variable that matches this. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and run a regression on being close to equator. That's gonna work out quite well. Uh, maybe malaria. Maybe being colonized, maybe it's good to be colonized by the Spanish, but not so good with the Brits. Uh, or maybe it's good to be colonized in the 19th century, but not in the, yeah, well, you know, we have to work it out a little bit. And s certainly they did. So this is the second generation of growth literature, looking for different, and you'll find that uh, Mr. or Mr. Professor, Dr. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for instance, who solves world poverty, is the most, his most famous thing before he was saving the world, he ran a regression where he found that malaria is correlated with low income. Yeah? So that's it. So if you eradicate malaria, give them nets, you'll increase their income. Yeah? Nathan Nunn, professor of economics at Harvard, has run a regression which shows that high proportion of slaves exported through f four centuries is bad for your income today, yeah? So that's why Angola is so poor today, because they export a lot of slaves. Never mind that Angola didn't exist when they were exporting it, but so forth. So they're projecting countries back in time, but never mind that. That's one correlation. You can also find that coloniz colonization caused underdevelopment in itself, or for instance, that being colonized gave you the wrong type of institutions, which gives you the wrong type of policies that gives you slow gro low growth today, yeah? So all kinds of variations through these ways. And you know, at some level, they do make sense. So, and, you know, so they, there is a correlation. 
that's fine. There, there, there is an evidence, a statistical evidence, but you can't tell, sell a book on uh, statistical evidence uh, alone. You need a narrative, you need a story to tell. So that's what they do. They tell stories next to the regressions. And here's why nations fail. If the, my first target of the first part was the target was the kind of type of literature signifies by bottom billion. Second part, why nations fail by Darana Chamoglu and James Robbins. So here we have explanations about why nations fail. And they say it's because they have bad institutions. Poor countries are poor because they have bad states that are in, controlled by bad people who make bad choices. Yeah? And you take one look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, you'll find two things. Pretty poor, probably, and the data are probably not exactly capturing GDP per capita in the Democratic Republic of Congo perfectly. But it's poor compared to Norway, it certainly is. And you might also uh, say that things are not working that well when it comes to the institution. Yeah, maybe governance isn't that great and so forth like that. So it seems to cohere that this country is poor because it has poor institutions. That's a correlation. But you still need to tell a story about how this matter and what the institution is. So if mainstream economists are, uh, if you stop them and ask, you keep saying institutions. What, what, uh, what does institution mean? Are you referring to a white building out in the fields or are you talking about a rule or what, what's going on? Then they will tell you <laughs> private property rights, secured private property rights. Yeah, so the reason why Norway is rich is that they have secured private property rights, whereas in Co Democratic Republic of Congo, they don't. Yeah, and that's why they're poor. So then they go to Democratic of uh, Congo, and they actually say, in this book, they mess up Congo with a K and Congo with a C and DRC, and, and the Congo is actually in Angola and so forth like that, but that's confusing to many of us, so we can understand that. But then eventually they make the argument that they are poor in uh, Congo today because there weren't private property rights yesterday and therefore they didn't plow yesterday and that's why they're poor today. Yeah? Because if you had private property rights, you'll own the fruits of the land. You'll own the land yourself so then you can plow it, you can invest in it and you'll get richer and so forth in your output and it will be on a growth path. Yeah? Investment leads to more growth and so forth like that. Since there were no private property rights, they will not have the land. So then they say that is what makes them poor today. Well, that makes, again, might make sense in an economic theory book, but it, not in a history book, because it ignores the fact that even if there was property rights in DRC at the time, this is also a place with sleeping sickness. And if you, a plow is okay, but a plow with a cow is what you really want. And uh, if there is sleeping sickness in the same area, there is no cows. So even if you had uh, a type of, of uh, a private property right that allowed this, it would make rational economic sense to import a cow there. The cow will die, and so would you and your family, because you would probably contract sleeping sickness as well. But let's ignore that. Let's pretend there is no sleeping sickness there. Then this still makes, uh, and this is what colonialists, uh, colonial administrators would discover in the early 20th century, they went there and said like, huh, these people are poor. It must be because they're not plowing. Let's give them a plow and let's start plowing. And then they found out that soil fertility is shallow. So if you plow in a place where soil fertility is shallow, first rainfall comes and the land is ruined. Yeah? So the argument about the plow, it has been tried before and it's not a good solution. And it may, that's the point here that institutions are, you know, uh, is an outcome of what makes rational sense in its geographical locations. You can't measure institutions on a scale from one to five and say the way that Norway does it should be exported everywhere and therefore that would be the right thing to do. It also ignores the fact that land was abundant and still is in some parts of the Democratic Republic Congo. So then a private property rights, if it was instituted, would be a total economic loss because it would cost more uh, than you would uh, to protect a private property right than it would be the benefits of just letting people grow it uh, freely. So, there is, so that's why it uh, does make sense. Uh, there is a lot of problems with this literature because they're putting some factor X in the past and correlating with outcomes today. There's a lot of missing history then. So if you're buying that the gold coast 
is poor today because uh, Ghana is poor today because it exported a lot of slaves three or four hundred years ago. You have to kind of, in that regression, there is no history between the slave exports and today. So it doesn't, for instance, tell you anything about how come Ghana and the Gold Coast was able to grow from, go from having absolutely no cocoa production in 1890s to be the biggest cocoa producer of the world only 20 years later. And that even in the context of bad institutions or lacking private property rights. It might not have closed the gap between Germany and Ghana perfectly, but it did double or maybe triple GDP per capita in Ghana during the time. That might not be so important to economists at Harvard, but certainly did matter to the average farmer's uh, living standards in, in Ghana at the time. Um, so there's also some missing policy implications. Uh, when Douglas North received the Nobel Prize in economics in the 1990s, uh, he did so for his work that told us that the institutions matter and history matter. And this was during a time when Russia was, uh, now it's Russia, then it was Soviet Union, was crumbling, cra crashing, collapsing, uh, partly due to the work of Jeffrey Sachs, but that's another story. Um, and he was asked then, uh, Professor North, Professor North, do you have any advice for Russia? Because that would be a, you know, there is a Nobel Prize economist there. What should we do with the biggest failing economy in the world right now? He said, get a new history. Yeah? Because the, 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 uh, the reading of the, the equations is that some types of history leads you to bad growth and others don't. Yeah? So it's very, very weak on policy implications. And even if you do read policy implications out of them, you do read the wrong one. Land Pritchett called this, why aren't you Denmark policy implication. And that's, is the, it is actually, if you read the regression results, you find out that if you, institutions are, you know, perfect institutions are measured at five, and worst type of institutions are measured at one, and then if Norway is 4.8 on that scale, and, and Angola is 2.1, then the literal interpretation of the regression is that they have to become Norway, become 4.8, to then become as rich as Norway. Of course, that we know through history that's not the case. And we also do not know that we know that there is a relationship between how institutions respond to economic growth and so forth like that. But one thing we know for sure, looking at China, for instance, is that you don't, it's not like China is growing quickly now because now it's Norway. It is a, its own unique history. Uh, and that's part of what's, what's uh, missing in this story. And that is indeed the paradox to be told by economists that history and institutions matter, particularly if you're a historian. If someone tells you history matters, oh, that's interesting, how so? What kind of history? And then they give you what uh, Branko Milanovic called uh, Wikipedia with regressions, which I happen to think is an insult to Wikipedia, not to the economists. So if we uh, do... Uh, what I suggest in, in my third chapter of the book is that we should rather think about Africa as Afri growth in Africa as recurring. It's uh, been a, certainly a bit to the determinant of proper uh, historical history writing and also proper policy advice as to what to do in the period of boom and, and, and bust that we haven't en uh, embraced fully, that there is nothing that makes these economies incapable of growth. Rather, the problem right now is a lot of growth and what to do about it. And that's not a new problem, it's been there before. So that we are looking at, this is just different ways of showing that on, this is the percentage of all population in Sub-Saharan Africa living in a country that grows faster than 3% through time, yeah? With a 3% three, three year moving average. And that you show that the majority of the African population live in a country that grows faster than 3%, except here in 1981, yeah? And then again, the majority lives. So then we are, a pro we are ex a let a stylized fact about being that the problem in Africa is a failure of growth. There is nothing happening. There's no investment going on. Uh, uh, the institutions have failed. I let that be in uh, the, the frame that needs explaining, but it only was true for maybe a decade or so. So then the challenge is to try to move to explaining the growth as it happened rather than to all the time suggest why there isn't something. So try to explain something rather to explain uh, what is not there. But you need to then, I think, work towards explaining trajectories. So how Ghana uh, becomes Ghana 
and continues to be Ghana rather than why Ghana is not Germany. Uh, as I made the point before, with the, the help of economists, we can explain now two-thirds of the gap between, this is a William Easterly regression, two-thirds of the gap between Tanzania and Japan can be explained by the fact that Tanzania does not have the same ethnical composition as Japan. But that's not very relevant for Tanzania, which can't readily change their ethnic composition, uh, nor is it a very useful thing to know uh, for a policymaker, because they surely doesn't, they're not so sh very, very important about, for them it's not too important to know with ec econometrical certainty two-thirds of the difference between Tanzania and Japan, what matters to them is to go from $1,000 to $2,000 to $3,000, and surely not the explanation about why they aren't $40,000 per, per dollar. So that's, I think they were trying to focus in too much on the wrong types of question. I think that has been caused by a uh, type of bias in, in economic analysis. Um, I think that uh, economic science has been too occupied with getting very clean causal results, results that are publishable, which produces very precise answers to unimportant questions. And I think also some of the distance between the observer and the observed has also meant that, and this way of doing economics is that we moved so quickly from tragedy to, to miracle. So if you want to, for instance, to explain uh, recent growth in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there is the data problem. So some of this economic growth is overstated. We do not know there is growth, but we don't know the political economy of growth. So we do not know who gets it and for what. Um, for instance, when it comes to relating poverty to growth, so we know there is growth, very impressive growth in Ethiopia, Nigeria, blah, blah, we get these numbers coming out there but we don't know how this relate to, to poverty. This is a graph produced by the World Bank, which shows you the, the, the lack of data. It shows you that of the 150 countries that, uh, that uh, uh, s uh, the World Bank was monitoring poverty in, they only have three or more data points in the, uh, in the, in the 1990s for less than one third of the countries. Yeah? So when we read the Millennium Development Goals and saying like we need to halve poverty since 1990 until today, we're actually talking about the baseline for which we only have observations for a third of these countries. And even until today, there is no much more, but we still lack, until uh, 2012, we still lack data for about one third of the countries, uh, which we're talking about the uh, growth being reduced and so forth like that. So bear that in mind when you get these continent-wide stories about Africa rising, or it's telling something about poverty falling and so forth like that. I think a particularly good case here is made for Kim Pinkowski and Salai Martin, who published a paper called African Poverty is Falling Much Faster Than You Think. And they have the, the nerve to actually draw a graph about what has happened to poverty in Democratic Republic of Congo uh, since 1970s. This analysis is based on exactly zero data points. Yeah? You need one data point to tell you something about the level. You need two to draw a line, what's happening to it. This is based on zero. In this particular graph, DRC is borrowing data from the average data of Senegal, Tanzania, Ghana, and Ivory Coast, which there are data for. And I think this is symptomatic of the way that sometimes economists study Africa. I think it would be very, very hard to believe that I could travel to Sweden and present a paper about poverty trends in Sweden, and then first say, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about poverty in Sweden over the past three decades. Unfortunately, there's no poverty data on Sweden, so I did the average of Denmark and Germany. Yeah? I think they would just send me packing. But for some reason, it's OK to publish that and draw this graph here. Uh, and I think that tells a little bit about the, uh, uh, the mind uh, about this. And I think that there is a an argument to be made that actually to study African economies properly, you need to get your hands dirty, you need to actually go in and do the work, you have to figure out how the statistical offices work, you need to figure out how the Ministry of Finances work, the central banks and so forth like that. Uh, otherwise you will be, will be uh, uh, misled. As I talk about the GDP levels are very soft in Ghana uh, in 2010 in, uh, in November, 
uh, 4th of November, GDP uh, was, uh, was uh, 25 billion SETI. On the 5th of November, it was uh, 45 billion SETI. So that meant that overnight, uh, GDP per capita increased in, in Ghana from about $600 to about $1,100, yeah? So on the 4th of November, Ghana was a poor country. On the, on the 5th of November, it was a, a middle-income country. Uh, on the 4th of November, it was eligible for concessional lending by the World Bank. On the 5th of November, it was a graduate and ready to enter capital markets. So clearly, there is a case to be made for a bit closer study to what's actually going on here. Um, but, you know, in, uh, and this doesn't stop here. On the 7th of April, that's a Sunday, uh, the director of statistics, Yemi Kale, stepped up to the podium in Abuja in Nigeria. And by the time he was done with his speech that Sunday afternoon, uh, Nigeria's GDP increased 89%. By the time he was done uh, announcing his new GDP estimates, total GDP in sub-Saharan Africa increased 20%. Nigeria became the, the bigger country than South Africa. So now they're still figuring out how they can get that S out of the bricks and fit in, fit in an N, because now it's, of course, Nigeria, not South Africa, who should be part of that um, G20s and so forth like that. I was asked in 2012, and I published poor numbers on the subject that we do not know as much as we think we know, and I asked, you know, so do you know, what do you think now is the underestimation of total income in Nigeria? And at the time, to translate it to the readers of uh, African Affairs and Guardian, I said, about 40 Malawis is what I think is the unaccounted economic activity inside of Nigeria. It turns out I got that wrong, it was uh, 58, yeah? 58 uh, Malawis have now been found inside of Nigeria. And that should be, tell you something about the certainty about the trend of growth and the trend of poverty reduction in sub-Saharan Africa, if you start Africa by numbers alone. So that means there's a methodological learning here. You need to actually ask yourself who made these numbers and under what conditions were these numbers made. And so that's my uh, which I present in poor numbers, where I say that our knowledge problem by numbers is doubly biased. We know less about poor economies, and we know less about the poor people living in those poor economies. And that's a problem if you think that the World Bank is collecting statistics in order to help poor people. Yeah? If the, so I think in order to do better research, I think we need to work towards studying economies, the actual countries, the actual places, and not economics, uh, get rid of, uh, I, I'm not saying no one should study economics anymore and now we should all study economics. I'm saying the shift of emphasis uh, is required. I think it's too much on the, cl uh, the that side of the, the, the side at the moment. We need more study of political macro. I think that there has been a problem uh, with the combined power of the computer and the uh, availability of data sets that anyone can just sit uh, behind their desk and download and uh, find out what causes poverty, it's perfectly conceivable to calculate and to, tell, to write a paper on uh, the economic effects of civil war in sub-Saharan Africa without ever having set foot on sub-Saharan African continent. Yeah? So um, in which uh, country you, you have Sudan, you have Angola and stuff like that, you have some kind of estimate of it, the cost based on the data sets without knowing how that means. And I think we need also to step away from that types of explanation where we, which I call the subtraction approach, where you explain the lack of something with the lack of something else, and towards reciprocal analysis, where you try to explain how Tanzania works rather than explain why it doesn't work like Norway. Yeah, and that's the, the change, change of emphasis. Um, so then uh, let's rather study how they work and rather than explaining why they don't. And so I hope that this little book is a contribution and a right step into that direction. Thank you very much. Be interested into how much that may or may not skew figures and um, whether or not you included like, 
No, I've gone with the, with the normal uh, classification that where it means that no, most often in, uh, in these kind of uh, large and large country studies, then uh, North Africa is classified as different as than Africa. So it means that the World Bank, for instance, does one group of countries is North Africa and the Middle East, and uh, what is often used shorthand as Africa is actually Sub-Saharan Africa. And I, even if you go back to the 1990s, if people talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, it doesn't even include South Africa. So, that's, uh, so I'm going with the categories that exist. There are many arguments why that might be a misleading one, particularly if you talk about economic change over a long time. Um, it reflects uh, a kind of, um, you know, uh, not recognizing underestimating the trade over uh, over the Atlantic and underestimating the trade across the Sahara, for instance, and so forth like that. So there is problems with that view, but uh, I in inherit it from the categories that is already there in the literature and in the data sets, but it's a good, uh, good note and caveat. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. And um, I'm an MPhil and Afghan studies, and before I had started the course, uh, Why Nations Failed was like one of my favorite books. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, um, but I, I'm wondering, kind of, with that, from the from the viewpoint of like economics as a field, and mm. yeah, I think of like academic fields as like there's so much incentive to prove popular theories wrong. How did it? I mean, how did this pretty obviously like incorrect view become so dominant? Well, yeah, I there is. Um this is the the question is also phrased as an economist because you know you know the joke about the senior economist and the junior economist when the junior economist tells to the senior economist saying look there's hundred dollars on the street and the senior economist so no someone would have picked it up uh, so uh, and the, so the same sense so if I'm right about saying there is a obvious misunderstanding in the literature the 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 senior economist would say no we would have figured it out. Uh, so, but I don't think there's many reasons why that is not the case, I think. Um, partly it's because of, um, it, you know, the, the kind of way in which disciplines work. You relate to building on uh, and uh, the same type of ways of doing things. So uh, the economists l taught in macro uh, in the 90s, learned how to do a macro like Barrow did, and that's how Collier did their stuff, that's how Easley did his stuff, that's how Sachs did his stuff. So everyone used that, Penwell tables, and then they, they do the cross-sectional studies. And now we get this other legacy and uh, historical legacies kind of thing. Everyone is on the Darren Etchemoglu type of research and so forth. So I think this is academic trends. Um, and, you know, um, often it's shown, you know, Thomas Kuhn has a wonderful book about scientific paradigms, and I think that the the kind of the basic lessons to that applies a little bit to economics as well, that you keep doing, you keep just like small fixes on the way, but usually a big change to how you conceive things come often from the outside and often because uh, journal editors or, or uh, so forth lose track of a particular way of doing research. And so there is a methodological bias as well. Um, it still is very hard to, st to actually publish a country study in any development journal. So if you, you submit a paper on, on uh, economic policy and, and, uh, and, and growth in Tanzania, uh, you're likely to get that rejected in most places, unless it is, if it's macro, it should be global and should be all countries. And if it's about policies, it should be very small. It should be a micro-controlled experiment. Uh, that kind of political economy studies that many people think is important, maybe has gone more to economic historians, more to sociology and so forth like, and doesn't get published anymore because it doesn't mean meet the methodological rigor of economics today. Paul Krugman made the point uh, often that uh, the, the classics of economics of development, which were published in the 60s and 70s, wouldn't have gotten published today uh, because they wouldn't have met publication rigor of the, of the day. And that's uh, something worthwhile thinking about, I think. Um, I was just wondering, because you were saying how like 
Yeah, no, that's a very good, uh, good, uh, uh, good uh, question because, and I talk a lot about that in my book as well. And I, so I thank you for asking about it. Uh, it's what I'm the the central argument I said is that growth has been recurring, but precisely because these periods of growth have not been uniform, and precisely because these Eco periods of economic growth has been associated with very important institutional change. We cannot ignore them as just volatility. So that the point being that you have, you know, so during the, the, the 20th century, states go from having direct taxation to having a marketing board that taxes crops at, at the coast and towards now being a VAT and ro royalty state and these are so this means that there are states institution that focuses very very differently through time um, economic growth was dominantly based on uh, more dominantly based on uh, natural uh, exports in the early late 19th and early 20th century then more on a broad based manufacturing and service uh, and government based growth in the 60s and 70s whereas very recent growth has seen a, a, a radical Depend, uh, increase in dependence on external sector growth. So uh, that's the central argument as well. We shouldn't ig ignore these growth episodes in the past because we can learn from them. Uh, and we need to learn like how was growth dealt with before and what was good and what was not good about that to understand what to do with growth today rather than to just toss it out as uh, nothing changed, all the institutions didn't work. In the 60s and 70s, many of these countries had uh, development corporations, the development banks and so forth like that. These institutions are gone or reformed or missing. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of institutional questions you should be asking yourself, not why aren't they like Denmark. With the lack of data in African countries, how is that something that can actually be addressed? Is it something that sort of supranational uh, institutions like the UN should be looking at, or do you think we need to encourage African countries to set up statistics and institutions? Yeah, it depends a little bit what kind of knowledge question you're interested in and whether you have a knowledge question in mind or a policy question in mind. So one way you can think about it is that, oh, GDP growth rates are not reliable. And so some scholars will find out, well, that's not such a big problem because you see we have satellites uh, and so we can measure how much light is emitted from these countries in space and then so we can take a picture of Ethiopia every half an hour and then we can see the informal sector growth just like that and then we can run the regression across our global sample and find out how much one light eon is uh, uh, explained by uh, is explaining growth by such and such and then you can find out uh, how much Ethiopia really was growing. This is not a hypothetical example. There is a paper out there which does exactly that. Uh, so, yeah, so you can get some corrections to that. But that's not, that's a knowledge problem. It only solves part of the knowledge function because I'm interested in uh, finding out what happened to Ethiopia in a um, hundred and 150 years perspective. So in order to do that, the satellites would have to travel faster than light and then to capture the light that was emitted in the 80s, right, and the 70s and so forth. But if you could travel faster than light, you could also travel uh, in time. So then you could just go back and collect them. But, you know, I'm the, but it, so there are some problems you could solve by such things. Um, but historical problems and needs actually deep archival work. Uh, I think it's, uh, which I point out in the book as well, there are issues, for instance, of historical demography in sub-Saharan Africa, which has not been properly solved because there is just lack of people doing, having research on, on material change. It was very fashionable to study this in the 70s and 80s and then lost track of the, the discipline African economic history in the 1990s. It's coming up, up again, so that's a, so there is, but you know, so what scholars can do and what policymakers can do is different, but you know, if the data is not good enough for the central bank to decide upon what kind of monetary policy it should which it isn't, then they need to do something about it. Uh, part of the problem is that uh, you know, resources are skewed, so sometimes knowledge problems that seem particularly pertinent in Washington or London gets more dollars to be solved than problems that seem to be more relevant in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi. And that, so there is uh, asymmetries in knowledge there as well. 
just now, just now you mentioned that the African economies did after the world, after the World Bank decide, uh, under the World Bank policies of making the African economies more open. Um, do you think there's any possible correlations between two of these factors? Uh, well, so the idea was that uh, from the Berg report written in 1981, that the reasons that African economies were not growing very quickly was because state was intervening too much so that the price signals were out of function. So that agricultural growth was too low or lower than it should have been or could have been if price signals were working properly. Uh, so what they were saying is that Nigerians would have produced more food, more agricultural exports if they would have gotten a higher price for it. And so then uh, World Bank and IMF said, okay, we're liberalizing this. Uh, turns out there wasn't much of a response. Uh, so then you can think about, okay, why is that? Uh, so maybe there were technological constraints. Uh, maybe the World Bank were wrong in their analysis. Uh, maybe they liberalized institutions that give out seeds or built roads at the same time as they expected agricultural goods to flow. And maybe they were uh, misinterpreting the signals as well. One of the things they were very concerned about in Nigeria was that price and rice imports were high. So rice imports being high or food imports being high could be interpreted as agri agricultural production is bad, the growth is bad, and that's why they're importing so much rice. But you can also interpret it as exactly the opposite. You can say people are really well off, so now they're importing a lot of rice. So, uh, so both, of the, both of the cases, so there is a so what you need to do is to look at the data, and then you need to think, okay, there are how many ways can I explain the, the changes of that, and what other ways can I uh, counter check and, and figure, uh, support this with other types of ethnographic study, other ways of fi fi figuring out why people are doing what they're doing, rather than just looking at correlations. <laughs>